Modern airliners have a redundancy, double up of the most important systems, for example generators. So losing one generator is almost a non-event, because the other generator can take the extra load without problem. But losing both generators will make things a little more interesting. Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magne Nordahl, I'm an ATA captain and instructor. In this video I will explain what happens when both DC generators go offline and talk you through the procedure. And if you follow me to the end of this video, I will share a little secret that are not written in the manual. If you are not familiar with the electrical system in ATA aircraft, I will recommend you to watch this video over here. I put a link in the description below. And here is a quick introduction. The main electrical system is 28 volts DC and is supplied by two starter generators and two batteries. The batteries support the most critical systems and can be used to start the engines as well. Some avionics are powered by 26 and 115 volt AC, constant frequency power, supplied by two inverters. And then we had a third electrical system, AC variable frequency. It supplies the system used for taxi and flight, like hydraulics and ice protection. An AC generator is attached to each propeller gearbox, and the output frequency varies with the rotation speed of the propeller. Therefore, it's called AC wide. In case both DC generators fail, there's a backup in the form of a TRU, transformer rectifier unit. It was introduced in the late 1990s and transforms AC electrical power from AC wide bus number two into DC electrical power, supplying the critical systems instead of the batteries. This allows for ETOPS operations. ATRs with TRU can be certified for 120 minutes ETOPS. This is what the DC and AC constant frequency electrical systems look like during normal flight. The DC generators are supplying the DC system and charging the batteries. And the inverters are supplying the AC system. And the TRU, when installed, is standby, just in case both DC generators should fail. In most cases, they will fail one by one. When the first generator fails, very little happens except for single shine and master caution. In an EFIS cockpit, the crew alert panel will show ELEC, and you will look up at the main electrical panel and see a fault light in one of the DC generator push buttons, and a green bar in the best high contact push button, indicating that it's closed. The other generator has the capacity to supply the systems. In a glass cockpit, the flight warning system will show LXDC generator 1 or 2 in the alert window. The electrical system page on MFD will show the same as the main electrical panel. The procedure is to do a reset by switching the generator push button off for 3 seconds and then on again. Then it's time to assess the situation. Thanks to the BTC, all systems are operating normally, but you shouldn't let your guard down. When the second DC generator fails, you will certainly wake up. The autopilot will disengage, and the first officer will use his or her flight instruments, together with the loss of number two avionics and many other systems. And here's a list of some of the most important ones. This is an emergency because the aircraft is now on battery power and the batteries have limited capacity. And not every aircraft has a TRU. We have three possible configurations in ATR aircraft. F is cockpit without TRU, F is cockpit with TRU, and glass cockpit where TRU is standard. Before we start, I want to point out that the purpose with this video is to show how we pilots apply the procedure 
Therefore, some details have been omitted. Furthermore, the electrical buses in different ATR variants may supply different systems. Enough said, let's start with the ATR variants without TRU. This is a DCGEN 1 and 2 fault checklist for an early ATR without TRU. To be exact, I modified the checklist from a later ATR variant by removing the references about the TRU. That should be close enough. When the second generator fails, the autopilot will disengage. But the only sound you will hear is a muted clack from some relays in the electrical rack. There are no alerts, but the main electrical panel is full of amber lights. The first officer has lost all flight instruments except for RMI. The captain has lost RMI and EHSI. Engine fuel and oil indications are lost, together with trim indicators and auto pressure. Since the first officer has lost the flight instruments, the captain must fly the aircraft manually. The first officer will deal with the rest. First, reset the generators. And note, the push buttons shall be left in the on position. There is a tiny, tiny chance that one of the generators will change its mind later on. If one of the generators is recovered, we proceed to the checklist for single DC generator fault. If none of the generators is recovered, we continue with this checklist. Land as soon as possible. The main battery will last for 30 minutes. And after that, you will like to be out of IMC conditions. The battery toggle switch is set to override. This overrides all protections and ensures that the main battery takes most of the electrical load. We want to save the emergency battery because it's needed when we shall land. Loss of both DC generators causes the outflow valves to close. And that means the cabin pressure starts to increase. Therefore, we must act within a reasonable time and control the cabin pressure manually. The checklist comes later. The extract fan has stopped and to provide avionics cooling, avionics exhaust mode is set to overboard. The captain EHSI is selected off to activate composite mode on the EADI. VHF1 must be used to contact ATC. And minimum cabin light should be off because it drains energy from the battery. The air data computer selector switch must be set to number one. And the same applies to the transponder. And you should set code 7700 for emergency. Automatic operation on the TLU is lost. The standby TLU actuator is energized when the TLU switch is set to a position other than auto. When the TLU low speed label comes on, the TLU switch is set to auto to de-energize the standby TLU actuator. The stick pressure and shaker has failed, including the fault light, so there is no alert. The procedure calls for an increased speed for approach. Side window heating is lost, so it's switched off as well. The windshield heating is selected off. It is powered by AC wild, but the failure alert is lost, and that means there will be no alert if the windshield overheats. And then it's time to focus on the cabin pressure again. The procedure for auto pressure fault requires some attention for the rest of the flight. And if time permits, you can check the bus equipment list. You have lost a lot of systems, and it would be more useful to figure out what you have. If you have some distance to your landing airport, you might experience that the main battery will die before you get there. You can monitor the battery on the left-hand maintenance panel. When the main battery charge reaches 19.5 volts, the standby bus under voltage light will illuminate, indicating that the battery is dead. The essential bus and the standby buses are lost and captain's flight instruments are lost as well. The emergency battery provides power to VHF1, transponder 1, air data computer 1, HSRS1, standby horizon, engine torque indication, and electrical trims. In other words, 
you can fly the aircraft on standby instruments and receive radar vectors from ATC. When you are about to start approach, you will select standby bus override. This transfers the DC and AC standby buses to the emergency battery. The standby buses power SGU-1, EADI, VRILS-1, flaps control and landing gear control, enabling the aircraft to fly an approach and land, but you get one attempt because you have about 10 minutes left on the battery. The public address system is used to inform the passengers because the seatbelt signs are not powered. The green hydraulic pump controller was powered by DC bus 2. We select hydraulic crossfeed to restore the green system. And finally, automatic idle gate is lost. Therefore, after the aircraft had touched down, pilot monitoring must pull the idle gate lever. 50, As pilot 40, monitoring, I always 30, guard the idle gate on landing 20, because the automatic function yeah. fails now and then, especially when you make a very smooth landing which I always do. A working TRU prevents loss of battery power and you can fly without DC generators forever. However, the TRU doesn't charge the batteries, so if you do a lot of engine start attempts, you will eventually drain the main battery. Again, when the second generator fails, there are no alerts. The procedure for loss of both DC generators is very similar with the previous procedure. The main difference is that the number of memo items has increased. If no generator has been recovered, we select the green hydraulic pump off, because AC valve bus number 2 has limited capacity. Then we can select the TRU on. If you don't see the arrow light inside the push button, it means the TRU doesn't work, and you must rely on the batteries. In that case, you open master ML 24-30-02P and follow the procedure there. On aircraft with TRU, the captain's EHSI is supplied by the DC standby bus, and that means the captain will have both screens and don't need to use composite mode. Look at you. In a glass cockpit, the autopilot will disengage silently because the alert is muted by the master warning. The autopilot alert comes later when the master warning is silenced. Display units number 1, 3 and 5 are lost. Display unit number 2 becomes PFD and display unit number 4 becomes EWD. In the alert window, there is a red Elect DC Gen 1 plus 2 message. The system page tests the same story as the overhead panel. We are already familiar with the first part of the checklist. The differences start with the avionics. The first officer will switch to attitude and heading reference system number 1 and air data computer number 1. And as long as the stall warning system is operative, the airspeed is not less than 160 knots and the aircraft is not below 1,000 feet, the autopilot can be engaged. Yes! And further down, we see that we must use MCDU number 1 because number 2 is lost. The MCDU gives access to the radio management system, RMS, which controls the radio frequencies, transponder, TCAS and navigation frequencies. And the rest of the procedure is as we have seen before. But wait a minute! You might wonder why we must apply the procedure for stick pusher shaker fault when the stall warning system supposedly is operative. Well, here is a little secret for you. The oral stall warning operates independent of the stick pusher and stick shaker. Therefore, you may hear the stall cricket while the stick shaker is inoperative. But uh, how do you know whether the oral stall warning is working? It doesn't have any fault indication, but since the stall warning belongs to the flight warning system, and that system worked perfectly a moment ago when it gave the warning about uh, generator failures, we must conclude that also the stall warning is working. And that's all for this time. 
If you want me to make more videos about other emergency procedures, please let me know in the comment section below here. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy learning!